go to a little tangent real quick. Was that the wrong thing to do? To well, throw that money at, and at, a, at a time that this economy needed uh, somebody to do something dramatic, are you suggesting that the things they did was wrong? No. But there were two policies, one of which was more important than the other. The monetary policy that Ben Bernanke pursued at the Fed, particularly after the Lehman crisis last year, of a massive expansion of the monetary base uh, was clearly the right policy, and that's the policy that Milton Friedman would have recommended had he still been alive. Who was a great monetarist. Really. Uh, who was a monetarist, and, and saw the cause of the Great Depression as being bank failures and monetary tightening by the Fed. We learnt that lesson. The, the other mm -hmm. policy, the Keynesian mm -hmm. policy, involves adding an enormous deficit on top of an already large structural deficit, and I don't think that that has been anything like as important in getting the economy out of the Depression scenario. And I think one has to make that distinction. The fiscal policy could turn turn out to be okay as long as we know how to stabilize it. But right now we don't. Right now we are clearly out of fiscal control. And at some point the world is going to wake up to that and say it is no well, longer I mean, sensible to pile these bonds up in, the, in a reasonable expectation that the United States will either depreciate the debt away by letting the dollar okay. fall through the floor or will actually start to call into question uh, its own commitment to these payments. I, I mean, mean default I is not a scenario we can rule out. Let me put it that way. Default well, there is are, not a scenario we can rule out. When you look at the unfunded liability... We're going to default on our debt, and therefore, well, what does that mean? What will happen first is that we'll default on the commitments made uh, under the Medicare and Social Security systems. That default, the domestic default, on our, as it were, domestic creditors is an almost certain outcome. The only question is which president takes it, uh, which president grasps that nettle and admits that we cannot possibly fulfill those commitments. The other question of default seems to me less likely. We're not likely to default on our uh, outstanding bonds held by foreigners. But foreigners may begin to question the sustainability of a fiscal policy that requires us to borrow a trillion dollars a year. And what uh, they'll uh, do uh, when uh, they do uh, that uh, is that course, they'll... Everybody, th everybody but, believes but, that. But everybody, right. wait, stop. So, everybody believes but that think you of cannot, what that means. What you that cannot means. continue at the pace we're yeah. doing. So, everybody agrees with that, but they do not necessarily assume yeah. that they're not policies and actions that can prevent the disaster of default that you are arguing are inevitable. Are. Of course there are. For example, the United States could introduce a value-added tax right. or a federal sales tax. Right. But can you imagine this Congress doing that? Well, I don't know. It depends, on, it, it depends on the options they look at at the time. So let's, you know, let, I mean, you've let, got, right. you've so got people like Roger Altman coming on this program saying they're going to have to have a value-added tax. Yeah. If they look at the thing and Neil Ferguson is saying to them, this is a disaster you face, perhaps they'll say, thank you, Neil. Maybe we better do something, and they'll add a value-added tax. Maybe they'll begin to believe that you've got to change the taxing policy. But you remember Winston Churchill's great observation that the United States always does the right thing At when all the other thing. possibilities have been exhausted. Uh -huh. I feel we're doing that now in the realm of fiscal policy. And the, the reason I mentioned default is not because I think the United States is going to turn into Mexico or Argentina overnight. Well, you almost but suggested no, that earlier. Let me make this point really clear, because it's absolutely crucial. In order to persuade investors to continue to buy U.S. government bonds, we will have to offer them a higher interest rate for their money. Now, when uh, that uh, happens, yeah. the bonds go down in price, the yields go up, our fiscal crisis immediately gets worse because the cost of servicing this vast $10 trillion debt goes up. That's what worries me most because what you could then get is a situation where real interest rates go up, and that's crippling for a heavily indebted economy just as it's crippling for a heavily indebted household. That's why I worry about Buffett's bet. That's why I think the U.S. could find itself slowing down in 2010-11, not speeding up. Who do you know that, of note, from whatever background, academia, government, Wall Street, believes exactly as you say? Let me name just one. Okay, just name one. Uh, uh, Ken Rogoff, oh, sure, my he's coming down here on this at program Harvard, this week, has just published a book. I know, but he comes this from the different. same place. Yes. Well, he comes from the same university, but yeah. I wouldn't say he comes from the same place. He's an economist, right? Uh, a very distinguished economist who used yeah. to be the International Monetary Fund. Uh, he and I think very in very similar ways about this problem. To, to name but one. I, I think if you were to ask uh, George Soros, is he optimistic about the outlook uh, for agree, the United agree. States, George Soros, you would get a very three, pessimistic reply. So um, what about Paul Volcker, who's a distinguished you American? Uh, I think former he would, Chairman's Federal Reserve. I, I think, if anything, he is more pessimistic than the two people I've just mentioned. Um, of course, it's hard for him to express publicly his disquires yeah. uh, because so of his official position. The, the Obama administration is just wrong-headed. 
No, I, 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 listen, I don't want to criticize uh, some very clever individuals who are grappling with a huge historical Larry problem. Summers, Tim Larry Geiger, Larry Summers, my ben former Bernanke. boss. These are some of the smartest people, Christy Romer, some right, of the Christian. smartest people uh, in, in the world. Austin Goldstein. I have huge regard for all of them. So, therefore, and I think what, what's the difference you, if, in them and so you? If, the people who have the power. What's the they, difference in the people who have the power? Charlie, they don't have the power. They don't. The Congress has the power. That's what people don't seem to understand about the situation we're in. Right now, the president proposes, with his clever advice, is helping him, but Congress disposes, and it will be Congress that decides whether the health care bill ultimately adds to the deficit or does not. But it, are you suggesting that if they have the deficit in four years, that that's not putting us on the track to a balanced budget, if they well, continue that kind of progress? But it's not, because their numbers, their 10-year numbers that they published in the budget, right. don't put us on course for a balanced budget. They put us on course to carry on borrowing a trillion dollars a year, as, as far as the eye can see. And that, it seems to me, is a recipe for trouble. Because there comes a point, and this is one of the lessons of, of financial history, there comes a point when the international markets simply can't take any more. And what's interesting about this is it's non-linear. It's not that people gradually lose faith in the credit worthiness of a country or gradually lose faith in a currency as an international reserve currency. It can happen quite suddenly that expectations change. That's what the British experience tells you. In 1945, Churchill still thought of the British Empire as a mighty force, equal in power to the Soviet Union and the United States. But it was a heavily indebted empire. Debt GDP was about 250%. What's more, the British then embarked on health care reform, the National Health Service, thinking that they had limitless funds to devote to rewarding themselves for the sacrifices and of the war. I remind you that the American health care reform that is proposed is supposed to be uh, it's, uh, 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 deficit neutral. Yes, uh, we'll see uh, if it really is. I I'd, be yeah. I'd be impressed. But here is the idea that nobody thinks that America is, that the world order is changing. You know, and you point that out. There is a new economic order and there's a new political order. We know that there's a level of shift of power to the, to the West, East. You know, and, and the, the president knows it, everybody in Europe knows it. That's not, a, that's not an idea that people are people, suggesting you know, is not true. But it, it's not that they no don't saying, say it, but do we really grasp what this means? For 500 years, the world has moved in the direction of the West. And the United States was the last of the great Western past to benefit from this shift of resources uh, from East to West. We're living through a change that ends 500 years of history, a great rebalancing of the world that will see Asian powers yeah. become equal in their stature in economic terms and then latterly it, in it, geopolitical it, terms. Is it a zero, sure is it really a zero sum game? It can be. Well, but is it? Well, is a it lot depends, or not? Right? Is it maybe the United States is better off with a smaller share of a larger pie? Uh, of course. But, you know, the share is always going to be getting smaller as these Asian economies grow. Uh, and as no, we slow down, my point and is I, think, I think the, the big question, which I don't really see being addressed, is how do you cope with the rise of a credible rival? The Soviet Union was never going to have an economy the same size as the United States. It never came close. And today, Russia's economy is 4% the size uh, of the US. We are facing a genuine superpower, a real economic rival. And I don't think American foreign policy has yet adapted to that. I think there's an assumption what in Washington would it do that we carry it, on with what, America. What, what would it do if it's to suggest it had adapted to that. What would it so do? So let me put it this way. There is a very clear dilemma which isn't often enough discussed, and that is this. Do we accommodate China's rise, and do we accept, rather as Britain accommodated the rise of the United States, that one day it will in fact be the dominant power in the world and we just better live with that? Or do we try to balance it the way the United Kingdom sought to balance the rise of Germany, by making alliances with the other powers in that region, India being the obvious candidate? That is the dilemma that is right at the heart of US foreign policy today. And yet I have the impression that we're so distracted by our colonial wars, and I call them colonial wars quite consciously in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we we don't see that big picture. The Chinese see it very clearly. Uh, and at least one of the superpowers in this game is thinking in the right kind of terms about the way the world is going, both economically and geopolitically. Neil Ferguson, whose book and paperback is called The Ascent of Money, which is also the title of his documentaries. Thank you for joining us tomorrow night, former Vice President.